Humans are weak. All of you definitely be. We need shelter from the rain and the cold and the wind. Our teeth are no match for most raw foods, and we can barely lift half our body weights. But despite that fundamental weakness, we want to do really cool things. We want to go really fast. We want to swim without ever getting wet. We want our air to be 72 degrees, no matter the time of day, or year, or where we live. We want to fly. But evolution didn't give us wings, at least not yet. So we need engineers, and engineers need inspiration. Now, I love nature. I like to go into it, necessarily, because it's hot or cold and smelly, and I definitely don't want to sleep, like, outside. <laughs> but I do love nature. I love nature because with the same set of tools, it has built so many things. Organisms have figured out how to breathe through their noses, mouths, gills, distributed tracheal systems, and even their skin. It's amazing. Now, of course, you might say, sure, nature's done a lot, but we're humans. We want to do things that are way more complicated than what simply nature solves using evolution. But in reality, nature is solving complicated problems every single day. And the building blocks of those problems are really the same things. So let's take housing. We live in BC. We have a lot of people here. And they need to live in a small amount of space. So what do we do? We build apartment buildings. Similarly to the African Social Viewer, where up to 400 families each have their own unit, and they can raise their family individually, yet collectively. Or maybe you have a lot of money, and you build a big mansion. Similar to the bald eagle, whose nests are six feet across, three feet deep, weigh up to a ton, and can last up to 30 years. Also similar to your typical McMansion. <laughs> okay, so we have all these problems to solve, and nature does them, but maybe actually the opposite is true. Maybe they're so complicated that we really can't understand what's going on. And of course, there's also competing problems, right? They might want to build a house, but at the same time, they're trying to feed themselves and have babies and all of these other things. Can we really get to the essence of those problems and really actually learn something from them? And we can, and we do. Researchers from Switzerland have been studying the salamander to understand how one organism can seamlessly go from walking to swimming and back again. To do that, they built a robot, and you can see a picture of it here. So this robot will swim, and it will swim, just freely keeps on going, swims along. You can see it's created of all of these separate units. When that robot reaches the shoreline, it just automatically starts walking without any problem. So we really can get to understanding these. Another example is shark skin. It's covered in teeth. It turns out that fish scales evolved into your teeth. So they're really, really tiny. And you have to look really, really closely to see them, like with a high-powered scanning electron microscope. Biolog biologists and engineers at Harvard have done this. And not only can they see them, what they found is that these tiny microscopic objects have a large effect on how the shark actually swims. So the smallest part of the body is creating the speed that the actual large shark goes. OK, so are we going to cover our boats with teeth? Probably not. But we can start thinking about how are we dealing with the surface of a boat to make it go as fast as possible. And this technology is actually already being used. For example, it inspired shark skin swimsuits that they use in the Olympics. So in my own work, I study sea lions. I love sea lions because even among the natural world, sea lions are unique. So most fish and mammals swim with their tail, or their fluke, or their caudal fin, or whatever's at the back of their body. But sea lions swim with their arms. I mean, they're poor flippers, but they're mammals. So it's like an arm, and they have an elbow, oops, close, and a, an elbow, and a wrist, and fingers. And they take these big appendages up over their head and clap them into their bodies. That then sends water in one direction and sea lion in the other direction. So I think this is beautiful. And not only is it beautiful, it's really, really effective. Sea lions are very, very fast. They can swim up to 50 meters per second. 
That is an entire Olympic swimming pool, every single second. It takes Michael Phelps 22 seconds, and it probably takes me about a minute. So they're great, they're fast, they're agile, and they're also adorable. So how do we do this? We go to the zoo here in DC, and we take a lot of videos. We film the sea lions as they're swimming um, in their tank. So like I said, they do this clap-like motion. We then use computer programs to separate sea lion from not sea lion. Mark some points on the flipper, which you can see above me, and then we save those points. Then we go to the next frame, and the next frame, and the next frame. So what we've done is we've taken this physical action, a sea lion swimming freely in a tank, and turned it into a mathematical equation. We then build a robot to go with it, and have our robot recreate that motion. So yes, it's complicated, and it takes a long time. But the point is, we really can fundamentally understand what's happening in this natural process. OK, so nature does complicated things. We can work hard to understand what it's doing. But do we need to? I mean, we already know how to fly and how to push ourselves through the water. And we have that technology. We refine those solutions. We tune those solutions. We make them as good as they can possibly be. But then what? What if we want to do something that can't be done with a fixed wing aircraft or a propeller? Nature has infinite solutions to these problems. And it continues to find more and more for the process of natural selection. So let's go to that propeller. I mean, it moves boats through the water, so what's the big deal? We have been studying the propeller for 50 years. And despite that, no matter how good we get at building propellers, they will always be noisy. They will always create huge wakes, and they will always cavitate and break and do these terrible things. So we can design boats that work with propellers. But what if we want to do something that we can't solve with a propeller? If we look to the natural world, maybe we can have five or six or seven solutions so that we can tailor boats to fit what we actually need to do, as opposed to just solving the problems that fit the solution we already have. So as you go out into the world and solve problems that don't even exist yet and innovate, I challenge you to look to nature for your solutions and use those in our human problems. Thank you.